Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're at in the world. Thank you so much for being here today. Yes, thank you. I'm calling, I'm Christina Marentes, Director of Admissions for the EMBA programs here at UCLA. I'm calling from Pacific Time in, in Los Angeles. It's 5 p.m., but I know that I saw a few, everyone is really from around the world. So thank you for joining us at whatever time it is in your region. All right. So the, the this really the registration lists um, span from uh, across the globe. And it's really remarkable uh, to see such candidates interested in, in, in this program. I, I believe that it's a true representation of the unique nature of the UCLA and US program in its diversity in the class profile each year. Um, our program bring, brings together business professionals from across the globe and it fosters relationships that impact organizations and people globally. Uh, today, I'm joined by Desiree Lai, my counterpart at the National University of Singapore. Desiree, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, guys. Lovely to meet every one of you. I'm also here with Vanessa Escara, our Applications and Admissions Manager on the UCLA side. Hi, everyone. I look forward to um, speaking more about the MBA and how it can fit into your life today. And our special guest today, we'll bring out later, but I'll let him say hello, is Isaac Bess, our alum from 2019. Hey, folks. How are you doing? All right. Awesome. Thank you. So today, um, for the first part of the session, Desiree, myself, and Vanessa will be sharing information about the UCLA and US EMBA program, followed by a Q&A and introduction from Isaac, so he can share his perspective and how um, the program changed his career and, and, and potentially changed his life. So uh, we can go to the next slide here. Of course. Oops, I jumped ahead. Not that quick. There, there you are. Go. All right. As mentioned, the UCLA and US dual MBA degree program is very unique. Here's a quick snapshot for more detail. The program, as you see here, is 15 months long, and we visit Singapore and the US twice, and China and India once. Each time we're in country, it's for one to two weeks at a time in this truly Asia Pacific US focused experience. Each year, our class size ranges from 30 to 40 students. And we prefer that our program size does not exceed more than 40, 50 students. So it rem remains intimate um, in its cohort with a low student to faculty ratio. So whether our students are looking to enhance their career, explore a new one, or try entrepreneurship, our executive career coaches are ready to support them through one-on-one -on -one executive career coaching and counseling, and then also a leadership curriculum. And last but not least, a highlight of the program is that students graduate with two MBA degrees and join two incredible alumni networks, leading to limitless opportunities. All right, here is a um, snapshot of some of our most recent rankings, as you can see here, the, um, the, the program is ranked highly. This is across the, the world and programs across the world. Um, so if you, as you can see here, QS rankings ranked at number three, uh, Financial Times ranked number 11, and US News was ranked uh, oh, sorry, UCLA itself was ranked the number one uh, U.S. public institution for the sixth year in a row. So as you can see here, the program is truly um, well, well regarded and, and well cared for by its alumni who um, help support our, our rankings. All right. So 
Who is NUS and, and who is UCLA? I'll start off with NUS. NUS is National University of, Seven, of Singapore. For 57 years, National University of Singapore Business School has offered a rigorous and rewarding business education to outstanding students globally. Founded in the same year that Singapore gained independence, NUS Business School stands among the world's leading business schools today. It is distinctive for offering the best of global business knowledge with deep Asian insights, preparing students to lead Asian businesses to international success and to help global businesses succeed in Asia. It's ranked number one in Asia Pacific by QS um, report. And as you can see here, National University of Singapore climbed up to number one worldwide, uh, breaking into top 10 for the first time this year. Number eight. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry. Breaking it in, breaking into the top 10 at number we, eight. <laughs> we aim to be number one. Yes. <laughs> we aim to be number one as always. <laughs> well, who is UCLA? UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, is um, located here in Lo Los Angeles, the most vibrant, creative, and culturally diverse cities in the United States and really the world and um, it's considered um, the heart of Southern California and its economy. UCLA Anderson is the business school here at UCLA and it is the leading business management schools in the world and is renowned for its teaching excellence and its research in advanced management thinking and also entrepreneurship more recently as of, as of late, most, mostly um, entrepreneurship as well. So um, UCLA is driven and consists of a community who embodies and values um, our pillars of success here at Anderson. We call them the pillars of success, and that's to share success, think fearlessly, and to drive change. So if those pillars and those intrinsic values resonate with you, UCLA Anderson and NUS could be a good place for you to um, be. It could be a good place for you to get your education. It could be a good place to um, foster your ambitions. So as you can tell, obviously, this MBA program has really brought two powerhouses together. Next slide. All right, so how does this program work? How do we get all of this done within 15 months? Here's a little overview. Here's a quick snapshot of how it works. Um, our classrooms are in different countries. So as you can see here in year one, starting in May, we're in Singapore for one to two weeks. And you can see there, those. that's a list of our curriculum. You're gonna take corporate finance, um, leadership managerial skills and orientation. And you can also stick around for additional time addition, in addition to the nine days into the 13 days to take electives while you're in country. So hence the, the, the date range for all of the segments. As you can see, nine days to 13 days in Singapore, eight days to 11 days in, in the August and at the US in the US. That additional three or so days is because of electives that you can add on to, to your curriculum. So yeah, this is a quick snapshot there. We're in Singapore twice over the 15 months, in the US twice over the 15 months, in China once, and that's November, the first year, and in India once, and that's in February, the second year. And we can go over any questions that you may have about this very unique schedule later. So our curriculum and, and modality. In recent program developments, we added several electives and an entrepreneurship path for our students' master's thesis or capstone project. Um, and this, so this program allows you to cherry pick electives from 
either NUS or UCLA to accomplish your own personal academic and and professional goals. Say perhaps you wanna take more electives in marketing or entrepreneurship or in finance or negotiations, organizational behavior, courses that have a little bit more of psychology backed ways of making decisions in business. You can do so by taking electives in addition to your core courses that you're taking in the different countries. Um, Being able to customize your your MBA across both campuses, we think is a huge value add to a program like this to make the curriculum uh, um, tailored to your liking, tailored to to what you like in in your professional and and personal goals. Um, Let's see here. Yep. All right. Master's thesis, as I briefly touched on, your master's thesis is um, your capstone project. And this happens within the the final few months of, of the program. There's two paths in taking the master's thesis. There's the management practicum path that is a uh, consultancy path. You work with companies that are looking for MBA students to help them come up with a, a business solution, solve strategic problems for them. So after the end of these months, you approach the company, the organization, it's C-suite, it's, it's decision makers with these potential um, um, strategic um, solutions to to their, their problems. And so that's the consultancy path. That's the management practicum path. Now, we also have the business creation program, which is new as of just last year and has gone, gone well so far. So the business creation path is for our entrepreneurial minded MBA students. So in this business creation projects, our EMBA students can launch something of their own or launch something alongside their classmate that has a really good idea. Um, and this is the, the entrepreneurship path for the master's thesis. Um, So when taking that entrepreneurship path for the master's thesis, our EMBA students also need to take two electives in entrepreneurship called entrepreneurship venture initiation and business plan development. So this is more of a program with structured curriculum um, tied to this um, master's thesis. So you use those courses along with your core curriculum to come up with the the best um, plans, the best projects for your master's thesis. And these master's thesis projects are really great because you join a a group of classmates to go about your master's thesis. And that's a five person group. You choose your group with your, just who you'd like from your classmates and also who has maybe a similar interest for, for achieving a master's thesis in a uh, perhaps an entrepreneurship healthcare uh, master's thesis, or perhaps wants to work for the company, the existing company and the consultancy path who is in, in the entertainment space. We're in Los Angeles, so we get some of those. Um, so it's, it's a really great way to explore different industries um, really flex your functions and flex the core courses that you've, you've just learned so well and put them into practice. That's the goal of these master's thesis programs. So um, yeah, that's that's a little bit there. One neat thing I wanted to mention uh, about our master's thesis is that uh, UCLA Anderson pioneered the first business school field study program in 1968. So this is truly tried and true method. Um, Together with NUS, we facilitate these field study programs for international uh, companies to allow um, students to apply their theories to real world uh, business challenges. So this is, I think, a highlight of the program. Next slide. All right, I'll pass it on to Des. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Hello again, everyone. I'm Desiree from the National University of Singapore. Now, who will you meet? Who will you be learning with and learning from? Um, what you're seeing here are the stats from the past five years. So in, the, in a typical class, it's between 30 to 40 students, as Christina mentioned earlier. It's kept small because we have found that a class that size, it makes it easier for you, know, for you to bond with your classmates. And for many, because of this, they have formed lasting friendships and, and networks because of that. Now, in a typical class, the average age is around 39. The average number of years in terms of work experience is about 15.5 years. Average number of years in regards to management experience, whether it's leading or supervising a team, for example, it's about nine. The female proportion, we are very proud about this. Uh, we have you know, increased it to 45%. Countries of residence, where they're based in basically, we have seen an average of 20 in a class and 27 nationalities from five different regions. Next slide. Now, are you from any of these industries or functions here? Now we have seen people from, you know, um, so many different uh, industries like financial services, tech, entertainment, healthcare, manufacturing, as you can see here. We have seen those from consulting, business development, law, general management, and the list goes on. And we have seen those from, you know, uh, in a specialist role, team leads, managers, head of departments, GMs, CEOs, and even presidents. So to summarize, we aim for diversity in all aspects because it adds richness to the class. We believe in peer-to-peer -peer learning and how important that is to the experience. So imagine to have all of these people from all sorts of you know, cultures, backgrounds, geographical locations, and so on, all grouped together in the class. Just imagine the network and the wealth of knowledge you can gain from taking this uh, particular class and this particular program. Now, moving on to a very important slide, how much will you be investing? In total, this program will cost approximately 142,000 142, USD, which is broken down into installments paid across the 15 months. Now, upon acceptance, you will be expected to make the first payment to NUS, and then the remaining balance will be split between UCLA in USD and to NUS in Singapore dollars, do note that this, um, you know, the program fees, it does include Singapore's goods and services tax. By the way, uh, the Singapore government will be increasing the GST by 1% next year. So that's the amount the, that you see there on the screen. That's the amount if you were to pay your acceptance fee before the end of this year. Now, what does it cover? It covers study materials, you know, um, networking dinners, transport to and from the company visits, you know, uh, your uh, immersive experience during uh, your in-country segments, stuff like that. What it doesn't cover, however, are things like lodging, airfare, or out-of-pocket expenses. There are campus lodging options for you to consider, but subject to availability, of course. And if not, you know, there are hotels that our program management team would be more than happy to recommend. But, you know, feel free to look for something that suits your taste and your budget. Now, moving on. Who are we looking for? Well, you will need professional and leadership experience, okay? We are looking for someone with a minimum of eight years of working experience after obtaining their bachelor's degree. Someone with high level managerial responsibilities of people resources or projects 
or a pivotal role in achieving business goals. Those with that collaborative spirit, innovative thinking, and academic readiness. And to dive deeper into the whole application process and requirements, I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Vanessa. Vanessa, over to you. Thank you, Desiree. All right. Hi, everyone. Let's get into the logistics of everything. Um, our goal is to make the application process um, seamless and transparent to complete. And on the screen here, you can see our application requirements. The requirements are pretty straightforward and the application will ask you to share your career and academic history. But more specifically, I'd like to call attention to the first and the last bullet. So as you can see here, the GMAT, GRE or EA executive assessment score is not required. Instead, we evaluate each applicant to ensure that they're prepared for the quantitative portion of the MBA programs, and if needed, uh, provide any uh, sponsored materials for them to complete before the start of the program. Um, and regarding the TOEFL and IELTS exam, um, the English exam, may be required for those who hold degrees from countries where the official language is not English. Um, there are some, there are abilities to get an exemption, but if you have any questions, we just recommend to reach out to the admissions team. Um, here you can see, um, we truly value all of our students' experiences and just want to make sure each student is prepared and to set you up for success. And my biggest tip in this process is to just bring forth your strengths, your qualities, and your experience. You've already done kind of all the hard work and show how you can leverage them within our program. Um, and so if you ever have questions about the application materials, you can reach out to myself or any of the team members, and you can also find it on our website. Um, here you can see in this next slide, um, kind of the, the overview of the, our admissions and decision timeline. Um, right now our application is closed, but it will become live on August 1st. So even though it opens August 1st, you can reach out to me. I mean, that's in a couple of weeks, we can coordinate um, sending that over if you're interested in getting the, the ball rolling. Um, and here you can, you're already doing the first step, researching the program and meeting with us. You're here today indicating interest, but we do offer one-on-one -on -one, um, phone calls if you ever want to discuss your candidacy further. And this is year round. Um, and you can next gather your materials, submit the application when it opens on August 1st. Our round first round deadline is December 1st, and we recommend that you submit by then so that you could be eligible for our application fee waiver. Um, we will, if you submit by December 1st, round one, your application fee will be, the $200 fee will be waived. And um, once you do that, we'll reach out by in, uh, for an interview, by email invitation, and from there we'll release our decisions. And this may seem like a lot, but below you can see our emails for the NUS team and the UCLA team, but um, we recommend that you just keep in touch with us throughout this process. And next, we'll, I'll hand it off to Desiree to introduce our guest today, uh, Isaac Bess. That's right. All right. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, by the way, we will be taking in your questions very shortly. Um, you'll be able to type them in or to, you know, um, raise your hand and, uh, you know, turn on your mic and ask us your questions in just a little bit. But we're very happy and honored to have Isaac Bass with us here today. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And um I hope you'll be able to do us a huge favor. You know, we want to hand things off to you. We've been talking sure. way too much. So maybe for the next five minutes, tell us more about yourself, like describe your overall experience, what, motiva what motivated you to take the program and uh, how have you been able to apply what you've learned from the program to your work? Sure take thing. it away. Yeah, thank you. And I love the sound of my own voice. So I'm happy to talk all about myself for as long as you're willing to hear it. 
Um, my name is Isaac. I uh, I grew up in New York and Tokyo, and uh, I I I went to college many decades ago now, and I I emerged from college with a plan to become an academic and study history. But uh, that plan went off the rails very quickly when I started working for a, a record company in New York um, right after college, and uh, and what ensued was um, many years of working in the music business. So I worked for record labels. Uh, I got involved in the early days of digital music when iTunes launched in 2003. I was based at the time in San Francisco. And um, and I spent um, much of the first 10 years of the, the 2000s working on the earliest partnerships in the digital music space. So first ever Spotify partnership, first ever Amazon Music partnership, and so on and so on. And uh, and while doing that, I also, one of the partnerships I, I worked on was um, a, a very early version of uh, of what is now a sort of templatized partnership for YouTube, for music on YouTube. And I got to know the the YouTube music team quite well. At the time in 2010 or 2009, 2010, uh, YouTube was a very different thing than it is now. And in fact, there there weren't, there wasn't the sort of like the company structure, let's say. Um, but even the content on YouTube looked decidedly different than it does now. And so I, I ended up getting recruited by YouTube, and I and I started working there in um, in 2011. And I spent the first um, three years, three four years working on music licensing, and then I moved into um, what's called a product partnerships role, which is sort of like a catch all business development role. At the time, we were contemplating the launch of what's now called YouTube Premium, and so we identified that there was this category of partnerships that would be needed for um, for a successful subscription product. And so I was charged with doing them. And, and I'll, I'll say that like at every stage in my career, I had this plan that I should probably get an MBA. And, and, and mostly it took this form of sort of like ambiguous anxiety where I was like, I'm just not super happy. You know, I was 25. I was like, I'm just not super happy in this job. So I should get an MBA. And then I got a different job and I was like, all right, well, I'll put it on hold for a while. And I kept doing that. And I kept doing that. And then, um, in 2016 or thereabouts, I had been working at YouTube for some time. And yeah, I think probably most of you know, working for Google is pretty nice, right? Like a good compensation, certainly relative to working for record labels, my compensation was really good. Google stock price is solid gold. And so on, on the face of things, everything looked like it was as it should have been. And yet I felt this like persistent feeling of like, um, not uncertainty so much as like a feeling that I needed to do something in my career that I wasn't currently doing. I was smart, I was successful, um, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sort of like progressing in the way that I, I felt like I, I wanted to. And, um, and at big companies in particular, that sort of like plateauing or even or like slowed growth can, can be really um, disempowering, right? It can make you feel very much like, oh, well, maybe this is, I was working for like the coolest company in the world. It's like, oh, maybe this is just what I'm, I'm going to be a mental manager at like Google for the rest of my life. And so I had this colleague who quit to go do the full-time MBA at UCLA. And I, was, and I really liked him a lot. And I was, I was checking in with him and he was like, oh, you should, you should check out UCLA. I, I didn't apply to any of the programs. I just, I, I, I found this one program and it was really the right one for me. And so I quit my job working at YouTube and I went and did it. And so I started snooping around and I found out about this, the UCLA and US program. And I had spent a lot of my career and my childhood going back and forth between uh, the US and Asia. And so I felt very comfortable with that. And, um, and the way it was pitched to me, it was a slightly different pitch <laughs> in 2016 than it is now. The way it was pitched to me was like, you're a busy guy working for YouTube. Why don't you come to Singapore for two weeks and hang out and we'll teach you some stuff and then we'll give you two degrees at the end of this cycle. And of course, like it was more complicated and quite a bit more work than that. But it, um, and we can talk about it in more detail, but like the sort of short summary is that it had this transformative effect on my career, whereby I immediately quit working at YouTube and went to go work for this company that would become TikTok. And I was one of the first um, international employees of ByteDance prior to TikTok launching, which uh, over the course of the last five years has proved to be one of the best professional decisions I ever made. And, um, and I definitely would not have made that decision. You can imagine I had to convince my wife that it was a good idea to quit working at Google to go work for some random Chinese company no one had ever heard of. And, um, and, and again, it was like the, certainly the, the smartest thing I ever did. <laughs> and, uh, and, and a lot of it is attributable to specifically 
the, just looking at the the agenda for your you, you know the academic adventure you're all about to embark upon, it was specifically due to the leadership class that I took in Singapore the first week, where we were running around the, the building and and I felt so completely transformed on my perspective in the world. And I think so frequently for all of us, it's easy to to feel like, especially when you're in a privileged place in a place that's not so ter- it's not torturous, to feel like oh well maybe this is just where I should be and what part of what this program really taught me was like that I was capable of doing quite a bit more. And so I went from being a, a very low or mid-level manager at Google to running a, a very large part of, of TikTok. Um, now, a short five years later, um, and again, like al- almost entirely attributable to, to this experience that I had in, in this specific program. Um, now that said, like, uh, I, I, so it's just, you should all you should all go get MBAs, right? And and most of you should probably get this specific MBA or this these specific two MBAs because it's it's a really smart thing to do, um, and and it's hard to pay for and it's not fun or whatever. But but by all you know statistics bear out, right? Like it's a good investment; it will work out well for you. Um, the only people that I knew who, for whom this, pro- this 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 program wasn't didn't do the thing that they wanted to do were people who wanted to ha- to make a hard pivot. So I had one specific person who was like. Uh, I'm in sales and I want to become a marketing person. And that, and you know, in this program, everything is hyper compressed. So you actually can't learn enough about marketing as a 35 year old in like six days to make a hard pivot into like, you know, a marketing role. There's, there's other things you can do to, to sort of scratch that specific career itch. But for everybody else in my, in, in, in my cohort, at least it was truly like this transformative thing. So um, the, the, the practicalities of, Doing this, sorry, probably going over time now, but like the practicalities of what you learn are, um, I don't want to say they're secondary because they're not, they're actually really important. But the, in, the intention is not, especially to get this this level of like um, advanced degree when you're mid-career as opposed to like when you're 27. The intention is not to become great at accounting or great at statistics or any of that kind of stuff because you're not, in three days, you're not going to learn. Like I, I learned accounting in three days. It was torturous. It was terrible. I don't recommend it except for you. You should all do it because it's the right way to squeeze enough accounting into your brain so that anybody for the rest of your career can say like, here's this accounting, you should take a look at it and you can read it and understand it, right? You're not going to become a, an accounting professor, but you can look at it. And it really empowers you to become a true leader. Because that's what leaders have to be able to do is say like, oh, here's this, you're not a marketing person, but here's this marketing report. I can do that now, right? I can look at statistics and understand what it is. Um, no, one, you don't want me as your statistics tutor, but I can understand all of it. So um, that was the impetus for, for me in this role. Um, and, and, and taking this sort of like wild leap of faith. And, and, and I can't say enough positive things about it. So I'll pause there after that breathless self-introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. Were you already with TikTok when you joined the program? No, I was literally like, so I was at working at YouTube. I was like, oh, I'm so tired of working at the greatest company in the whole world. I flew to Singapore. I was embroiled. I did this leadership class in three days, which was amazing. I, I started the marketing segment and I, I've been talking to ByteDance about, this is pre-TikTok launch. So I've been talking to ByteDance about this role and they were like, why don't you, hey, you're in the neighborhood. Why don't you come to Beijing? And I was like, okay, sure. And then of course, like Beijing and Singapore are not at all in the same neighborhood. So it's like this like quite tumultuous thing to get from one to the other and back again. So um, it was literally in the first segment that I, I had had such, such an incredible experience um, already, especially being around like, a cohort of, of other smart people, but whose background was decidedly different than mine. You know, I'd spent most of my career in the music business. And so I was used to talking music business stuff. And then I was meeting this guy from Malaysia who was in the oil business and a guy from India who was in the like concrete business and all like completely very smart, but completely different um, skill sets, completely different set of experiences. And so I was like, oh, I got to quit. I got to take this job. And I remember like at the end of my first segment in Singapore, we had this group session where I was like, should I do it? And I asked my, you know, 40 cohort members, like, should I do it or not? And they were like, do it. And I did it. And it was just one of the best things I've ever done. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, because um, I reckon one of the m- most common concerns for a lot of prospects would be, um, they could be, you know, uh, thinking about changing and switching their jobs, but to have that conversation with, uh, you know, their future employer about, you know, the fact that they will be, you know, flying to different countries every quarter to do this particular program. So, you know, maybe do you have like any tips 
perhaps to to share with prospects? Yeah, I mean, I, I I positioned it to my to my first employer, and then again to my second because I was I was deep in. I mean, I, my first year at TikTok, I was still taking accounting and stuff like that. So I was I was very, and also had like two young children. So like there was a lot of multitasking. You know, I have a very generous wife too, which is important actually. Like you should all take stock of your personal life also as you consider. Um, there's never like an, a, a perfect moment to like go back to school or to have a kid or get married. Like it's always, there's always going to be something. So you can make a million excuses of like why not to do something, but like you should be aware that like it's a bunch of for 15 months, it's going to be a bunch of extra stuff that you're not currently doing. So like you will watch less Netflix or, you know, go to the gym less or drink less or whatever. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, like I, I think being cognizant of like your, your family situation is, is really uh, critical to, to making the decision, but you should do it anyway, for sure. Okay. And um, how would you typically prepare for each segment? Because there will be some free segment preparation. So, you know, take us through your journey and then and, and tell us, you know, tell the prospects that are here with us today, what happens during the segment? Sure. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the work that's required in advance of the segment is is not insignificant, but it's not so significant as to be like terrible, right? It's not, again, like, I mean, you've all been to undergrad, right? So it's like, there are some topics that are just naturally more interesting to you. So when I was like slogging my way through accounting pre-reads, that was not super fun for me, but also it was achievable. Um, and uh, you are all probably much like, I'm sure you all were A students as undergrads. I, I was not. I was not. And so I had to, you know, 20 plus years after graduating with a bachelor's, I had to like relearn how to like not not fail classes, um, which took some discipline. But it, it's actually it ended up being like a really good exercise for me in in sort of ruthless prioritization. I think, you know, you, one, one often feels in your career and in, in your personal life that like other oh, Oh dear, I think we are um, experiencing a technical glitch. Was that I actually was able to to have a job, to have two babies, to have a wife who didn't murder me, uh, and also to not fail out of this program. Um, so it, it's all achievable. So the, the 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 sort of the work in between segments, you can be more disciplined to me and spread it out effectively over the time, or you can cram it in at the last moment. But like it it is real. Um, but it's not so torturous as to be like. A reason to not do it. I found I will mention like I sat in on I had to do some makeup classes because I I would have like I missed half of a segment because I had to do a business trip or whatever. And so I I took uh, interestingly I took classes with uh, both NUS core um, and uh, like executive MBA students and also uh, UCLA uh, core MBA students like folks who just like take accounting on Thursday nights for like six months. It's a very different experience and um, and I think. Uh, much much more arduous to be honest like I had a much harder time in those classes than I did in in the the sort of hyper intense three days like you're going to learn accounting in three days that's it um the ones where it was like months and months and months of going driving at UCLA or going to UC, going to Singapore uh, over and over again that that was more challenging for me so that 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 work is 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 not not insignificant but it's not too terrible um the work in the segment itself is um is appropriately frenzied, let's say, because you're trying to cram a lot into a very small number of days. That said, um, the environment is intentionally fun, right? So like you will have time to, first of all, you're going to be away from your spouses and your families, right? So so like, don't like, don't bring your kids to Shanghai for the Shanghai segment, right? Like just be dedicated to like learning accounting in Shanghai. Like that's not, take your kids to Shanghai some other time. Um, so it's intense, right? And it's like, you know, all morning and all afternoon, and then there's work to do in the evening, and then there's time to spend with your with your cohort and with your with your your classmates um, and your professors too, who are who are certainly there with you, right? So in many cases, the professors travel with you to China, to India. Um, you, there's UCLA professors who come to Singapore, there's Singapore professors who come to UCLA. So like they're all there with they've they have made the same commitment. Like these two weeks are just for spending time with each other. And, um, and I found that to be um, obviously like, you know, you don't love everybody in the same amount amongst 40 people, but it was a bunch of really smart, really interesting people with whom I, I still have a very active relationship. 
Awesome. Uh, just a couple more questions before we open it up to the floor. Uh, feel free to type it in if you're a little bit shy, uh, or you can always uh, raise your hand in a bit and uh, you know turn on your mic. So Isaac, if you could name one thing, uh, what was the most valuable or you know most memorable takeaway from this entire experience for you? Um, I think I, I think most profoundly it was understanding my own capacity. So I, without wanting to be immodest, right? Which is it, like it's weird to talk about yourself in this way, right? So like if we were all just hanging out, I wouldn't I would say this, but like. Um, but to understand, you know, after after having a professional career of more than 20 years to then have have a, a, a change in my own perspective on myself was was quite profound. And um, and you, you, like I'm sure most of you know what TikTok is. Right. So like five years ago when I started, it didn't exist. And now it exists. And now it's a big deal in lots of different ways, positive and negative. And I had a big hand in that. And that feels pretty great. And I, I honestly don't think that I would have had the mindset or the capacity, not only to, to, to make this leap, but also to be successful as I have been at TikTok. Um, and so I have like a, I have a new boss um, who I just met with yesterday for the first time and um, our new COO. And, um, and I, I was thinking we had this great meeting and I was thinking, and just reflecting on on um, on all of it and thinking like I would not like five years ago, I would not have been able to, to do what I did. Right. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to have the conversation with my new boss about what we've done and what we're going to do and, and all the transformative things that we're going to do in the company had I not gone through. And, and again, it's not because like I had a great class in corporate finance. Right. I, I mean, I did have a very good class in corporate finance and I'm glad that I have that under, under my belt, but it's not because I learned a specific thing about corporate finance that let me talk to the new TikTok CEO in the way that I want to talk to them. It's that the whole thing cumulatively changed my outlook on myself. And I think, to be honest, uh, hopefully it's not too much candor for the UCLA and, and US folks, but like, um, I think that when people get MBAs when they're 26, right, they're saying like, I want to, I want to set up, I want to create like an, another stepping stone towards the, some, some like calculated advancement in my career. Right. But it's, but because they're young, they're 26 or whatever, they're like, Oh, I've got, I've got my whole, I got decades to figure all this out. Right. So I'm just going to have this feather in my cap or this bullet in my LinkedIn profile. I'm going to have this thing that's going to help me to do a thing that I don't know yet what I want to do. And I think when people are in their 30s and their 40s, it's much more, uh, um, like, say, like a feeling of professional dissatisfaction, right? Like, I know, I, I don't, I don't quite, can't quite, like I said, like I was working for Google, right? It was pretty good. And I don't quite know what I want to do about it. Like, I don't know quite why I'm not happy. And I don't quite know what I want to do. But I know I got to do something. And so it's almost like seeing a therapist, right? So like, I found this program to be very much like, seeing a, a like a, a career therapist who said like help help me to shape a bunch of things and, and help me to form decisions that got me to a place that's completely different from where i was before and i think that's the thing that was most important for, for me and I, you know everyone's different but like for me that was the thing that was most important so i got some cumulative career therapy that completely changed my life okay one more question for me any useful tips or advice for future applicants like just imagine talking to isaac you know from 2016. sure yeah i mean i uh, like i said at the outset i mean be um if you have a spouse like be like work talk with them about it right and set those expectations um you know i i, I got a lot of duty-free gifts at the singapore airport for my wife and children but that that's probably not enough, right? And I and I um I will I will continue to be grateful and paying it back to my wife for for decades to come. I'm sure. Um, I think that's really critical. And also, um, I mean, obviously, like I I quit working at my my job like within the first six months of being in this program. So like, um, that said, like I I was very candid with my employer about my intention. And for Google, Google has like a a mechanism. You know, there's it's been around for a long time. So there there was a mechanism for me to say like, hey, I'm going to do this thing. And it was like leave time that I had to add into my um, existing vacation. Um, but it was pretty painless at ByteDance, where again, we were, you know, we had 20 people who were not in China who were, who were employed by the company. It, it took a little more work, but I, but I think my candor with my manager and with HR was, was really important. But I think um, 
the one I don't think I have any practical regrets, but the one thing that was hardest for me was when I I wasn't really able to disconnect from my work. And I remember being in Shanghai in particular, and or maybe it was Shenzhen, but like really feeling like underwater because I had you know I had real academic pressure and also real work pressure. And I think had I been more forceful, with, I, you know, YouTube didn't go out of business, right? So like my inability to execute while I was learning about, you know, corporate governance in Shenzhen didn't impact the company. And so with the benefit of hindsight, I would have said like, hey, listen, you know, YouTube boss, I'm just not going to be online for the next two weeks, or I'm going to be online twice in the next two weeks, but I can't, I can't actually deliver anything. Um, that that would be my 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 sort of most overarching advice is like set expectations across the board in your life about what you can and can't be able to do. And if you do that, I think you'll have a lot more fun um, because you'll be able to, in addition to like take more away from the experience, you'll also be able comfortable going out and having a beer after, you know, on a Thursday night after a very long class. Um, but important that you set those expectations. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That was really insightful, really fascinating as well. Uh, I'd like to bring back my colleagues, Christina and Vanessa. So um, all four, four of us will be more than happy to take any of your questions. So once again, feel free to type it in the chat or raise your hand. I believe Hans, uh, you have a question for us? Yeah. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for Christina and team for hosting this event. This has been very insightful. And uh, congratulations to Isaac finishing this program and having a good progress in your career. That's definitely a hard work from your side. Yeah. So I'm actually at the same situation as what you explained before you took this program. So the only difference, I'm very sure I'm older than you. So yeah. <laughs> And then to the three, I, I, it took me two months to realize that I think I listened to your program in your previous industry. So yeah, so just to let you know. Um, yeah, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, the Christian and team, uh, would there be any exam for each of the module? And what kind of exam would that be? Second question to Isaac, could you just share with us uh, how actually the day like when you were in overseas taking those modules for a week or so? I mean, did you spend like 10 hours, 12 hours? in a day yeah. or was it like I, I can i can answer both questions so yes there are exams um okay. for sure right and the idea is that like um to ensure that you have ingested all this information properly so one one funny thing or maybe interesting for for you all right like most people who do a program with these two prestigious universities are like a students right like when you were in high school when you're in college you're like a students all the way right i, I want to you know 97 percent you don't have to get 97% when you're studying statistics when you're in your 40s, right? It's the, the intention is to, is to, again, like to be able to absorb enough so that, you know, two years later or 10 years later, 20 years later, someone hands you like a balance sheet and you're like, right, I, I, I can speak this language, right? So um, it's a little more mellow in that room. So there are exams, but let's say like less taxing than they would have been when you were 19 years old. Um, with regard to like the routine, so it's like wake up. Most people stay in or very close to the hotel where the sort of sessions happen when you're not in, obviously when you're in Singapore and LA, some people are, are local, but in China, India, most, almost everybody is not, I think in my case, everybody was not. So almost everyone stays in the same hotel, which is nice for me and some camaraderie. Um, you wake up, you eat some breakfast, um, and you, know, you make your way to the classroom. There's like a session in the morning. There's usually a break. There's in Singapore, there's some, nice stuff to eat always. And, um, and then you have lunch and typically it's like the morning session, at least not, and um, folks will correct me if I'm wrong, but for us, it was like the morning was one thing and the afternoon was something else. So you would have like, you wouldn't just be like relentless, like accounting all day long. It would be like half accounting needs with the marketing. Um, and then things typically wrap up. I want to say for, for dinner and, and all these meals are, are sort of on site and provided um, and mostly quite, quite good. And um and then there's there's work to do, right? So so different people, different schedules will will spend their evenings um, in different ways, let's say. Um, but there was a, a good balance. I found a good balance of like fun stuff to do and an opportunity. Because like the last thing you want to do is we be like, hey, I'm going to Delhi for the first time in my life, and like I spent my entire trip in Delhi in like the Hilton conference room, right? Like learning about you know marketing, macroeconomics, something like that. And so there, there actually is lots of time that you spend outside of the classroom, um, both socially, but also doing things like 
um, site visits to different companies and stuff like that. So it, it feels like it's not just like this, you know, like tedious thing where you're just sitting around, like, you know, filling out forms all day long. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah, I would just like to add, um, firstly, Hans, you know, that there, there really is no like age limit, And, you know, we have seen um, prospects, you know, in their 50s, 60s, and, you know, we have had some in their 70s as well. So, you know, if you want to do it, if you want to get your MBA, just do it, you know. There, there, there really isn't, uh, that really isn't like a perfect time technically to, to get that MBA and everyone's, you know, um, lives and situations are, are completely different. So if it's your goal, if it's something that you want to do, I would highly encourage you to go and pursue it. And also, um, to add on to the, the structure of the program, you know, it's not like how it was during your undergrad days, you know, um, it's, it's a modular structure. So yes, you will have assessments, but you, you won't have to go through your like midterm exams or year end type of exams. Okay. So, so I think, you know, that's something to also consider uh, in terms of the differences between this particular structure and how it was back then. Christina, uh, yeah, I wanted to add one one thing um, in terms of the first the first point of um, of you know age and where and you know being too old or or whatnot. Um, I actually think the more years of experience that you have and the more uh, knowledge of business, the more comfort you have of your function and how it relates to other functions, I think the better. Um, it, it, the conversations are a lot more uh, flow and not a lot nicer. Um, there's just a lot more richness in those topics and those conversations that you're having with your classmates and with your professor. Um, if you come out of, uh, if you had come out of undergrad and gone straight to the MBA, you'd have very little work experience and the MBA curriculum would seem and feel very theoretical. Um, this is extremely applicable. So that's, that's my point there, Hans. So we encourage, you know, the experience and we, we appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll go to Fernando. Yes, hi. You know, thank you for your presentation. I have a couple of questions. Um, one specific to Isaac. Um, Isaac, how are you? Um, uh, my question to you is, how would you describe the faculty staff, the professors? You know, are they a bunch of just PhD, you know, uh, you know teachers or... or, or, or how are the lectures are completed or done? Is there a combination of theory, uh, practical examples, or uh, experience that they have formed during their careers? You know, how, how, how would you describe, you know, the lectures and, and the professors um, in, in this program? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, so uh, across the two sets of faculty, um, you, you see a quite a diverse set of professors. Some some, uh, in my experience, some are, let's say, more tenured ex people who have been teaching core mm -hmm. things like accounting and statistics for, in some cases, decades. Um, and they they know how to teach accounting and statistics, right? Like it is like solid. Mm -hmm. it's, they actually do a good job of making it fun, even for people who are not natural to accounting and statistics. Um, but they're, they're definitely not um, like grad students. So, which I think is your question, right? Like these are all like, I think tenured professors at both institutions uh, who are of the highest caliber. I, I'm still in touch with my leadership professor, my strategy professor, my, uh, uh, what was the other one? I suppose like there was an influence. Oh yeah, yeah, it was a ne negotiation professor. So like um, really top, top notch. Uh, you know, obviously like everyone's different. I didn't like every professor exactly the same, but they're all high caliber for the most part. I think you, you, I wouldn't, I don't think there was anyone who thought 
I was disappointed in the in the academic part of this experience. Except again, going back to my first point, if you want to make a pivot from sales to marketing, you're not going to learn enough in six days around marketing to do that, right? And so, and that's not because of the marketing professor. It's because it's like you got to you got to learn more, right? If you want to become an accountant, you can't learn accounting in six days to, to make it your career. Um, and there are other programs at both UCLA and NUS that could do that if that's what your aspiration is. But for this program specifically, it's about having that holistic experience at the very highest level so that you can then apply it to, to the rest of your career. Okay, I have another question as well about um, the logistics. You know, um, I, maybe I misunderstood, but I think you lived in, uh, in New York and uh, I'm assuming that uh, you travel to Los Angeles and Singapore and the other cities. Yeah. You know, uh, so I, I grew up in New York uh, in Tokyo, mm -hmm. but I, I oh. live I live currently in Los Angeles. So for the oh, UCLA, okay. yeah, so for the UCLA parts, I just drove across town, which was terrible. Um, mm -hmm. And for the other segments, I I flew. Um, okay. Yeah, it's all basically very you, cool. you you did it yourself. I mean that the lodging and you 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 basically look for hotels around the schools and everything, and you you didn't have a problem. I did not have a problem. So for, for the India and China segments, the school, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, folks, but like the school makes it very easy. I, I think everyone almost without exception stays in the same place. Um, mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, it wasn't challenging. So for, for my segment, for my, for my cohort, we, we went to Shenzhen and um, Shanghai for in China and Bangalore and Delhi in India. And in each case, I I remember doing nothing. Like I, I booked my own flights, but I don't remember doing anything <laughs> special. In Singapore, I booked my I stayed at an Airbnb near the university, which is the way to go in Singapore because it's very cheap. And um and in UCLA, I lived here. So like you, you have lots of options. That that wouldn't be a barrier. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, add a couple of points. Um, like Isaac mentioned, you can actually consider Airbnb. And from what I've heard, um, especially as time progresses and you know, um, together with your group mates, there's this bond. You might wanna, I don't know, continue talking about uh your classes or work on projects together. A couple, not couple, but a number of them actually rented an Airbnb or service uh, apartment and stay together during the segment. So that could be an option as well to kind of lower your uh, accommodation costs as well. So uh, we will be here to help you out. You don't necessarily have to stay in the same hotel. Again, it's it, it boils down to your, your taste and your budget. But of course, we would highly recommend for you to choose a place that's not too far away from the campuses and so on. And I suggest staying together just because you get to know people a lot better. The good, the bad, and the ugly, of course, when you're living with them for, for two weeks. But I think a lot of it is the good. It's just the getting to know them and becoming um, family, really, with them. Um so it's it's a lot deeper than a than a networking connection. It's it's really getting to know them and they're your support. It's a it's a it's a tough program. It's a rigorous program. It's um, you're balancing a lot. So to know and feel comfortable with people that are doing it um, with you and and know that you can lean on them is is really important. So um, fostering those relationships anywhere you can, uh, I would suggest doing that. Um, let's see. Um, we will go to Katsuri. I saw you asked some questions here. Let's, um, let's go with, um, how long are the segments? The segments are one to two weeks long. So they're about one week for your core courses. And if you want to extend your ses session there in country to take electives, you're increasing your time in country. Um, there's also potential segments in between uh, sessions in between segments. So online, you may need to log on live, 
or on demand um, to catch up with some work in between sessions. Does school help with visas for travel to countries that need a visa? Yes, we do. We do support you there. For example, if you're heading into the U.S., um, you would need a student visa. So we provide you with an F1 student visa. You also need a visa for, is it is it China? So we provide you with the details on how to get that. But we do support you and um pay for your student visa to come to the US. And I don't believe they need one for Singapore and I don't believe they need one for India. I might be wrong there. Um, just a quick summary for the segments. Again, across Depends the 15 that. months, okay, across the 15 months, it's uh, six in-country segments. So it's between one to two weeks for each segment. So again, it boils down to your electives, okay? Which one you actually choose to do? Because now we do have a number of them offered online in between these in-country segments. So if, it, if you were to choose more of these online off-segment electives, it can then reduce the number of days spent traveling. So in a nutshell, um, you know, especially if you are planning to have this conversation with your bosses, your family, it's between 45 to 75 days out of the office across the 15 months. Do take note that uh, it includes weekends as well. Okay, so just recently uh, in May, our segment actually started on a Saturday. So technically, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, leave, days of leave, it might be a little lower. So do take note, it includes weekends as well. Okay, maybe we can uh, move to King. I see your hand is up. Sure. Thanks, Desiree. Uh, so Isaac, I'm based in LA as well. So 100% agree. With the drive across the 10 or the 405 is brutal. So applaud your dedication there. Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, how did you convince your incredibly supportive wife to quit Google and join the not so famous TikTok at the time of decision? Um, yeah, I should teach a class on this. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know if I remember, I think it was, it was a, a, a long-term campaign. I mean, we, uh, we have a good relationship and I, and, and she was very aware of my, um, let's say misgivings or my frustration with being a Google employee. And that's not, you know, Google is a great place to work. So I, I, I have mostly, mostly nice things to say about working there, but I, I just knew, she knew that I was frustrated and then I wanted to do I felt like I had capacity to do more and it turns out we were both right I did so I would say like it's a conversation to have with your spouse I would you know have it over time don't plan on hashing it all out in one evening um but uh but yeah like it's it's really just all about communication and transparency and I, I and like I said like she was I think when we started the process she was pregnant with our first kid so like we really had a lot on our plate. And so it was like, oh, can we do this or can we not? And, you know, the, the nice thing about these programs is that like you can, in theory, delay them forever. The problem is, is that everybody delays them forever. Right. So like and and there's never like like I said, there's never the right time to have a baby. There's never the right time to get married. There's never the right time to get an MBA. And so like you got to just do it at a certain point. Um, but I think if you set those expectations with your employer, with your spouse, um, and even with the school and your your classmates, I mean, we, we haven't talked about the management practicum, but like setting expectations about what you can do in a small group, like who's, who has capacity to do what in any given week is really important. And these are all skills that I, I helped to hone while I was on this program and that served me very well now because I'm very candid with my, my colleagues, my boss, and so like, oh, here's what I can do, here's what I can't do. Right, right. Love it. Uh, number two question is, you mentioned about the importance of cumulative career therapy and, and how you realize you're more capable or has more capacity. So I wonder what experience or people within the program gave you the most transformative, you know, career therapy? Um, I think the group, the group that I did my management practice with are certainly the people that I spent the most time with, both 
both academically and socially. And so those are those are the relationships that are still like very strong and you know communicating on WhatsApp every day. And they're the ones who helped me to sort of acknowledge to myself what my own capacity was. Um, there, there are other fascinating people. We saw a picture of Fernando earlier who, uh, oh, actually, like I should mention this. So, so the picture earlier in the presentation we saw is of this guy from my cohort, Fernando. And so he had, he had worked, he's probably like, I don't know, 40 or something like that now, 45 maybe. But he's, he's worked at Amgen like his entire career, right? So like very different from me, not, nothing to do with entertainment, nothing to do with tech or any of that kind of stuff, but like Amgen for life. And he approached the program as an opportunity to like um, dial up his Amgen experience, not because he was like looking to do other stuff, but he was like similar to me. I think I don't want to speak for him too much, but like he was like, I got to do something because I'm stuck here and I want to be here. And which was similar, but just different from my experience. So having that time with him, especially after some drinks, was really great because it, like it helped to, me to understand that like across, in my case, 41 other people, I think. Um, even though very few of us had any practical overlap in terms of like the, 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 the industry that we worked in, almost all of us had a lot of similar themes. And I remember I had this session in Singapore with someone where we were talking about like, it was, I think it was for leadership or something like that, but like this guy just broke down and started crying. And like, I mean, it was like, I'm not suggesting you're going to do a lot of crying in this program, but like, it was a, it was like a deep, a deep moment. And so all that really like cumulatively helped me to. To, to feel like this has really moved things where I wanted them to go. Yeah, bring tissue yeah. boxes. Thanks, man. I appreciate the answer. But yeah. sure thing. <laughs> there will be no tears. Don't worry. Tears of joy. Um, one question I wanted to address here is how is uh, the program for entrepreneurs? Um, so I think it's... Um, the program, it, because it teaches those foundations of business, it's very important, we see, for entrepreneurs to, to attend a, pro a program like ours. There's also, um, so, so learning that finance component, the marketing component, the different languages of business, because as an, an entrepreneur, you do have to wear all of those hats at, at many points in that journey. Um, also learning how to make your company and organizational uh, organization sustainable, um, keep it running for the long, long run, how to raise funds for your organization, all of that, and how to do it in a, in a way that has been, um, tried and true. You're learning from these professors, these entrepreneurship professors, and they're telling you how to do this. Um, so it's a lot less of operating on gut, which I know is easy to do, or, you know, you want to do as an entrepreneur. Um, it's more structured. So we've seen a lot of success in that. Um, there's a few courses that I would suggest you take while you're in the program. Um, as an entrepreneur, or as a something that we call an intrapreneur. It's individuals that have an innovative mind and, and, and way about business within large organizations or within organizations. Every organization needs individuals that have innovative and entrepreneurial ways of thinking and ways of pivoting would need be. We saw we saw the drastic needs of pivoting during COVID. Um, we, we saw that need for sure. Um, so it's important to have those skills. Um, so the courses that you can take in the EMBA program on the UCLA NUS EMBA program is entrepreneurship, venture initiation, business plan development. And then I would also encourage that you go about the master's thesis and, and um, the business plan development the business um, BPD, business uh, plan development, the master's thesis in entrepreneurship. We love acronyms at UCLA and NUS. <laughs> so um, I would suggest uh, th those courses in that master's thesis program. Uh, if the, I can add. Yeah, go for add, it. I would love so, that. So yeah, the idea of entrepreneurship, I think is, is often thought of as like, someone has a zany idea. Like what if there were gas stations in space? And then, and then, which is literally the business that one of someone in my cohort both started and got, I think, $30 million of funding for after our, after our, wow. court. so that's like, that's like the, you know, like they make a movie out of that stuff. Um, but, but to your point, Christina, like the, m m for most of the rest of us who aren't conceiving of gas stations in space, 
it's about like how how do I be creative and come up with new lines of business or new new anything in my in an existing company. And some of those companies are like mine, right? Where it's like only has only existed for five years. Some of them are like Google, or some of them are like I don't know, like um, Exxon or something. You know, like there's lots of different ways to be entrepreneurial in those in different kinds of spaces. But the core skills are the same, right? Which is around using data and structure to to sort of test hypotheses in a way that that then gets you what you want, right? Because really, like, all this is about getting what you want in, in one way or another, right? Like, how do I how do I convince people to, like, you give me funding for my gas station and space idea or give me a promotion or give me more headcount or give me whatever, right? And all that is some balance between, like, influence and marketing and data science and, and all the rest and entrepreneurship. So I, I think you'll be well suited in that regard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Um, in the master's thesis option for entrepreneurship, you can come up with your own idea and launch that, or you can partner with someone um, and launch their idea uh, for the master's thesis project. So um, if you're not sure of an idea, if you want to tag along to that idea, um, partially, you know, you could become a, a founder of this, this idea. And um, we've seen a lot of success with additional sources of an income from our alumni, just because they have, you know, they launched this or they launched this with some classmates while still maintaining and growing within their organization in their role, but they have additional sources of income now, which is quite nice. Um, so it, it's, it's a really nice, flexible way to um, di diversify your portfolio a little bit. Yeah, for my own master's thesis, which we called management practicum back in the day, which maybe master's thesis makes more sense. But our, our ours was with Wells Fargo, and banking was a space that I had zero personal. I continue to have zero personal interest in. No, no offense to bankers, but like it's not my thing. And and yet we did this thing. And just to give you a sense of like where entrepreneurship can play in these things. So Wells Fargo, <laughs> Wells Fargo were like, hey, um, we don't currently do anything for. Um, non-english speakers at Wells fargo Wells fargo and we were like what and they're like yeah we, we have like a spanish language tab on our website but that's pretty much it do you think we should do anything else and we were like yeah yeah you definitely should like absolutely and so we spent the better part of a year being like hey wells fargo i mean it seems very obvious now right like hey wells fargo like let us tell you about all the people who are getting degrees in america who are from india and how this is like a, a chronically underserved demographic of super high arpu high potential customers for you and they were like oh wow we never thought of it that way and so it made me feel very smart but it was 100 percent a function of like entrepreneurialism but in someone else's you know well uh, sort of sphere yeah absolutely uh bps you're asking if someone already has a company coming to the program can they use their thesis to work on a new part of the company um new part of the it depends how large the company is so there are some regulations to either doing the master's thesis in entrepreneurship or doing the ma the management practicum which would Isaac which Isaac is talking about so those can also be startups and, and smaller companies it doesn't have to be like the Wells Fargo so if you have a company it depends on the revenue there and you're looking to launch another branch or brand or or however that new entrepreneurial route looks in the existing organization you could do so in um, you can bring your organization in for the master's thesis with either the MP side or the entrepreneurship side. So yes, it's possible. It's possible in both paths. Um, Fernando. Yes. Hi. Hi again. Um, I have another question in regards of um, assistance, you know, uh, um, as you know, life happens, you know, and uh, I wonder if, for example, uh, I won't be able to, if, if I'm not able to go, for example, to to one of these uh, cities or, or I can go there, but, you know, late, you know, what are the consequences, you know, I mean, um, I will get a failing grade or I'll get half credit. How is it managed, you know, when you when you have these type of things? Yes, Isaac, go for it. Yes, I, thank you. Thank well, you for like, Yeah, I, I mean, I'll give you the like the Isaac version, and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe like um, just 
straight from my own experience. So like I like I said, like I dipped out of the very first segment to go have a job interview in Beijing, which was a completely crazy thing to do, but I did it. And then I made up the marketing class like a couple months later in Singapore, which so everyone was super cool about it. And um, and then similarly, there was another thing that I, I missed some I missed something for some business trip reason. That, like there was a business trip I couldn't or conference I couldn't miss. And so I, I had to miss it. And so obviously like you you want to one of the biggest benefits of the whole program is being with the same group of people, right? Cause there's camaraderie, but there's also like shared experience and shared resources and all this good stuff. So like, it was actually like, not, like I said, like it wasn't my favorite thing to do to like start driving to UCLA on Thursdays to take accounting. Um, although I met some interesting people there too, but my experience was very much that like the program was very accommodating to allow for things like have, having a second baby, for example, which I also did uh, while on the program. I, I, hopefully that's the party line as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, we are always here with you every step of the way because, you know, um, you have only just met Christina, myself, and Vanessa. We have a much bigger team. You know, we have the program management team that will be with you every step of the way to, you know, um, help you through perhaps picking the electives that, makes sense to you in terms of the direction that you want to go down, you know, um, and if something happens and we completely understand, you know, life happens, it could be a professional or a personal em emergency. Uh, we have had students who, you know, defer their segment. So uh, instead of, you know, uh, coming down to Singapore uh, just a couple of months ago in May, uh, one of the students will be joining the next class uh, the following May. So that is an option as well. So, you know, as long as you keep us in the loop, you, you speak to the program management team, we are definitely here to help work things out for you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see. Mm. King, I believe this is for Isaac. You asked, what is your biggest takeaway from the program that changed the trajectory of your life and career? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the certainly like the, the sort of self-reflection journey was really important. And, and not just that I was like... Um, surprise myself by fighting through adverse conditions. Um, but also having the time to be reflective. I mean, one of the things that's especially, you know, if you have like a, a busy career, or busy personal life, it's hard to to sort of step away from that and to be like, um, to really allocate the time to, to give this stuff thought. So like, you know, like, even in my current job, right, I have the, a, a normal amount of like professional malaise, like, oh, maybe I should quit TikTok and go work somewhere else. Right. But all of my time is spent doing TikTok stuff. Right. So I, I, it's hard for me to like, or like, you know, raising my children and stuff like that. So it's hard for me to like step away from that and be like, well, let me really think about this. Like, what does it really mean? And so having these dedicated sessions with people who are like very much in a similar sort of boat to just put heads together and talk about stuff and then have the, the sort of like um, academic resources to sort of structure those conversations was, was massive. Right. So say like, I feel a little, I'm not super happy with my career. And then like 30 other people are like, well, I'm not super happy with my career either. And then there's like a professor who was like, well, let's talk about that. Let me, let's put like a real framework around how you think about that stuff and not just be like, oh, I'm unhappy. Let me drink a beer. But like, oh, I'm unhappy. How do I like think about how to make a change in my life? That's really real. It's that balance between like having a forum, having the time allocated, having the, the academic structure for it. Um, and, and mostly just having the headspace more than anything else that was super important for me. Thank you so much, Isaac. And, uh, you know, just being mindful of the time, uh, perhaps you can take a, a couple more questions. So once again, feel free to drop it in the chat. Awesome. Thanks, King, as well. Thank you for all of your wonderful questions. <laughs> and thanks for uh, sharing your, your email as well, Isaac. Um, Vanessa. Um, maybe you could just, uh, you know, take a couple of minutes to do a recap of the admissions uh, yes. because I believe someone asked uh, this question early on, uh, a recap of the application process, the tuition and the timeline. 
Yes. Um, so <clears throat> at this point, we recommend that you connect with us, which you're already here doing. And as a next step, I would start gathering your application materials. The application opens on August 1st, and we released our decisions um, beginning, we'll release them in December. Um, the, this, the round one deadline um, is December 1st. And if you submit the application by the December 1st, you will be eligible for the application fee waiver, um, which is a great incentive to get it in early and also um, just to, you know, priority um, submission almost. And from there, I would just, um, let me see here, we require um, in the essay or in the application, they'll ask you about your career history. You'll have to complete some essays, select two recommendations. Um, and if applicable, you may be required to take the English proficiency exam if you hold a degree outside of um, a country where English is not the official language, um, but if you have questions about that, you can definitely reach out to us to um, evaluate your candidacy for that. And most importantly, we do not require the GMAT, GRE, or EA score. So as part of your requirements, you don't have to worry about that, but instead we will evaluate each candidate um, and let you know if any extra quantitative prep is needed and tell you that support. So in this step of the process, you've done the research, you can gather the materials. And the next step after this, if you're interested, would be to, you can either meet with us one-on-one -on -one or start get, uh, preparing for application opening on August 1st. And you can reach out to us anytime. Um, it's never too early to get started. Um, especially if you have documents that might be from um, international schools and you might be wondering how to even get that now. It might be a long time since you've even talked to your school. I can help you do that. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, we will send this recording out so you'll have that information as well. Um, yeah, so if you have any more specific questions, please feel free to reach out. That's the overall timeline for admissions and decisions. Yeah, um, so, you know, I've dropped our emails in the chat, so you can contact the UCLA team or you can contact me at NUS, mm -hmm. and uh, you can even uh, contact Isaac as well if you have any questions for him. And, uh, okay, we have time for one more question. So, Bondi. What would you like to ask? I'm hoping you can hear me. I'm sorry, I'm driving near UCLA, so you all you feel me pretty well here. Um, I, you may have mentioned it, and I may have missed it, but um, it was there a discussion in regards to scholarships and that type of availability also? If you have, just tip right over me. I apologize. I came in like five minutes late. Hi, Vondi. No, no problem. Uh, we didn't discuss that. Um, right now, we're in between um, approvals for the scholarship, so we'll have a more secured response to that um, actually within the next few weeks. Um, so just so you know, though, we do have a um, a representative here at UCLA and at NUS that can work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis to secure a loan through a private or a lender or a, a public loan. Uh, we'll help you submit the FAFSA. So they, um, and the person in particular, her name is Connie. Uh, Connie is incredible. Put in the chat. So. Oh, thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, yeah, Connie's incredible. So you can set up a one on one call with Connie to make sure that um, you get the, the loan that you, you'd like, depending That's on right the interest for you. rate. And yeah, so so I would suggest that as a next step, Fondi. But um, yeah, you didn't miss anything about the, the, the scholarships, as we call them, because um, right now we're just waiting on final approval from our dean. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us here today, joining us this afternoon or this morning. And also a big, big thank you for our special guest, Isaac Bess, for your Ooh. wonderful sharing and your stories. Thank Amazing. you so, so much. Wonderful job. My pleasure. Thank you, Isaac.